Welcome to MICE. Um, welcome to the Drawing Power panel discussion. Thank you for coming to MICE's 10th uh, year. I also want to thank Leslie Art and Design, our host, for these whole 10 years. So thank you, school. I also want to mention that MICE is presented by the Boston Comic Arts Foundation, or BCAF. BCAF is a 501c3 foundation uh, organization that we started a few years ago so that MICE could be a nonprofit, <clears throat> but we gave it the, uh, the grander name so that we could have a broader mission of uh, nurturing, encouraging, and supporting the art of uh, independent comics in and around the Boston area. Um, we are currently assisting, supporting uh, several newer shows, such as the Boston Kids Comics Fest, which will have its third annual show in April 2020, um, the Comics in Color Fest, which will have its first annual show in April 2020, and Pod Tales, which is actually a dramatic podcast festival, which is having its first annual show next door as we speak. So if you're into podcasts, um, run on over after the panel and the signing, um, and it's looking really good over there. And of course, we uh, gladly welcome donations to help with all these activities. Um, go to miceexpo.org if you'd like to donate to BCAF, or if you're uh, of a mind to become a MICE sponsor, you can do that too. Um, so without further ado, um, Bridget Alverson, moderator of the Drawing Power panel discussion. Thank you, Dan. This is gonna be a little bit of a challenge for me. <laughs> I'm of the short persuasion. My name is Bridget Alverson. My pronouns are she and her, and I am a comics journalist. I write for Publishers Weekly, Barnes & Noble, The Comics Journal, CBR, ICV2, School Library Journal, and I, mod and I edit the uh, Good Comics for Kids blog uh, at School Library Journal, and I am honored to be here tonight today with this group of people who have produced an awesome book. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but definitely grab a copy. I suggest that you only read it in short bites, though. And I, I do want to take a minute here to say this is heavy stuff. A lot of us are going to see some things that are going to make us feel some things, and we all get it. This is, this is friendly territory here if you feel uncomfortable. You know, don't, don't hesitate to get up, take a breath walk out, come back in. We're all, we're all friends here. So uh, I am going to start by introducing briefly each of our, uh, our participants. And they are going to, so we have a selection from each of their comics that we are going to show. And they're going to tell us a little bit about them. And then we'll have some more general topics about the book and the subject matter to discuss. And we will leave some time at the end for questions and answers. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce Diane Newman. She is a pioneer in uh, comics. And, um, and she is also the editor of this book, who pulled it all together, which must have been a heck of a job, <laughs> speaking as a former editor myself. And um, so Diane's comic is, Bring it up here. OK, so and this is Diane's comic. Um, so Diane, tell us about tell us about your comic. Oh, well, I guess I should have started with the whole page, but oh, yes, no, no, it did. It did. Sorry. Did. There's the full page. You okay. did. So that's the title, Grab Him by the Pussy. And it's sort of self-explanatory. <laughs> I found myself being so angry at the disgusting revelations that kept piling up. And of course, Trump's infamous quote was just one of the breaking points. And I, I wasn't sure, you know, I felt like helpless. Okay, what the hell can I do about it? This guy's president, you know? And I thought, well, I could do a book because I'm an editor. I'm a cartoonist. I've done books. And I know a lot of cartoonists. But what was really important to me was getting 
a big cross section of cartoonists, of women. Um, I thought about having men. It got very complicated and I couldn't quite, I was able to email or call a huge number of women. There are 64 in the book and they all had a story. I couldn't quite imagine calling up some guy cartoonist that I knew and saying, so have you been sexually molested? And you want to do a story about it? It just didn't compute at the time. I think there should be a book like that. There's certainly a lot of material, but this isn't it. So this is women of various sexual modalities. There's a couple of trans women. There's just as big a variety as I could find. The ages run from two of my students who are like 20 to Joyce Farmer, who started in the original women's comics, and she's in her mid 80s. So they're from as many different races and countries as I could find. I had to have them speaking English, unfortunately, <laughs> or we could have, I could have um, gotten a larger spread, I think. Um, anyway, for now, this is women's personal stories. You can change it. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's, here's... that's just a close up of the. Right. I have a character called Dee Dee Glitz. I invented in the early 70s, and she's still around. And now she's talking to me. <laughs> so, and she's naming names, apparently. Yeah, right. <laughs> and this is just the deluge of the names of the time that I did the book. There's many names that are not on it because they've been added later. And these were all vetted by Abrams. So these are not people who've been um, tried or convicted. These are people who've been named in public media and have either denied it or said they're sorry or got fired. And there are a lot of very famous names. There are some that are, I didn't know about. Um, Brett Kavanaugh's on there. <laughs> and this book, by the way, is dedicated to Anita Hill. And I knew that right away. That was like really important to me to do that. So I think we could just keep Okay, going all right, yeah, yeah. Um, so Katie, um, your comic is called Let Me Count the Ways, and it's like a checklist. Yeah. <laughs> so why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, it's like, how do I love the Let Me Count the Ways? So I was just playing on that. It's just about the ubiquity of like, being kind of like having your ass slapped constantly, like have, getting harassed at work, like, somebody saying something to you on the job. So it's not about a particularly um, heavy, like single situation, but I was trying to think about, um, I've just been hearing a lot like um, this like backlash from the Me Too movement. It, it seems to me like maybe a lot of people don't know that we're constantly being harassed. So I was just trying to illustrate um, just small moments from literally everyday life where that kind of thing happens. Yeah, and Katie, that, it's a really interesting point because I think until two years ago, a lot of the world didn't know. Maybe women didn't even know that it was happening to each other. But like after each one of those events, I don't know about you, but I would always have to, it'd take me about two, three hours to just bring myself down to a simmer again. You know, and, and that's a huge amount of lost productivity, of, of lost talent and labor, I think. And I'm thinking of this because I, I lived in New York City, so, you know, I used to get grabbed on the subways on a regular basis. And, like, that's a hell of a way to come into work, yeah. you know? Well, and one of my panels is my dad at dinner one night asked me if I had ever been catcalled on the street, which <laughs> I thought that was, like, so disgusting on, like, many levels. But I'm... but. The most disgusting thing was like, how, you don't know the answer to that question? And then I said no. And so um, that's one of the panels there. Um, so yeah, that was a weird moment. It's like, you don't even, you know, we're invited to talk about it, but like, we don't want to talk about it. So it's a mixed bag all the time. And you never want to make a big deal about it, but it is a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kelly, um, your comic, is a beautiful, very pure, almost visual representation. Can you tell us about 
how you came up with this particular imagery. Yeah, so um, I think I rewrote this comic about four times before I landed on what I really wanted to talk about. Um, I, I eventually landed on not wanting to talk about any of the actual experiences that I had had. Um, I've done some other comics where I tried to explore a lot of those really raw feelings that I had, a lot of the anger, a lot of the like reclamation that I was trying to go through. And I eventually landed on wanting to just have a conversation literally with myself from these various points in my life where I'd had encounters um, that are appropriate for this book. Um, and focus it around having an episode where I'm forced to remember something. So I've thought a lot about how, you know, there's these moments that happen to us that we have no control over them happening to us, but there's also the lingering element of having to remember it and think about it and process it. And kind of what do you do then when it's stuck in your head forever? And the guys who are the ones that do this to you get to kind of wander off and live in their own version of that reality. So I was really struggling with, um, you know, just like, like seeing mention of someone who I had an experience with kind of continuing on with his career and still never feeling comfortable enough to name him, but just kind of knowing that he gets to know what he did, but continue onwards while I'm still stuck kind of trying to figure out, you know, how do I keep myself together and just move past it. So I wanted to like have my present day self talk to my past selves to kind of say like we aren't stronger because of this experience not like that kind of sentiment but that we can do this like because we are processing these things and we're facing them that all of these things get to just be continuously evolving and being a dialogue within myself to just make sure that I'm okay that I'm processing, that I'm identifying it and, you know, just, just giving it space, but then also trying to figure out what's next. Um, Claire, uh, what can you tell us about your comic? Yours is very short. Yes, mine is very short. Uh, so in fact, it's in, in its entirety. Um, I work in the autobio realm, so uh, it was very important to me to be telling a story that was um, pretty much just exactly the words that happened in regards to the experience. But then it was also very important to me to uh, talk about what I did next. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I included in the story what if this had ever happened to somebody else and they encountered my tale, where they should go next and what needed to happen. But I also had to acknowledge that at the time when it happened, it didn't really occur to me that something had happened to me. Like it didn't even seem to me like I had been, uh, I'm gonna say compromised in some way. Like it just struck me as like, oh, a miscommunication, even though I felt I had been very upfront and you know very vocal about what my expectations were um and then to still have to end up in a doctor's office being like i now have to do the adult thing and have you double check that make sure it, everything is okay and then me myself having to be like tell myself that everything was okay even though it was like it's like it didn't even occur to me until me too really started rolling around that i was like oh no that was not cool like that was fucked and I think that's something that a lot of us have kind of been experiencing as Me Too continues to move forward of like, you go back and you review all of these things and all these moments you've had that you were like, oh, that was just weird. Okay, I mean, whatever. And it's like, oh no, completely unacceptable. Completely unacceptable. So I kind of wanted to make it like, it's a small moment, but it's a moment where I had to then go be more of an adult than I was at the time. Great. And one thing, and it's something that I'm thinking about as I'm reading all of these comics, there's no faces. You've obscured the faces. Why did you do that? Um, I uh, take a lot of inspiration from Barbara Kruger's uh, photography work. And um, I think she does a really good job of anonymizing people by voiding out their eyes. Um, 
And I wanted to have a story where, I mean, it, it is me. It is a visual depiction of what I looked like at that time in my life. Um, but I wanted to make sure that it was anonymous enough that someone who came behind me and read my story could see themselves in it and then uh, A, know that it had happened before, but then B, also know what to do. Okay. Okay, and now we have this and... Um, Can you give her your mic? Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so Sumia, uh, tell, us about, tell us about your comic. Okay. Um, I mean, speaking, okay. <laughs> um, so my comic's called Last Night Was So Funny, which um, kind of was the tone of my experience when it happened. Like, it was kind of strange. Like, I I went around telling people, like, after it happened. And I was like, hee hee, like, these guys were being weird. Like, this is so crazy. And people were like, no, it's not. It's actually bad. And um, <laughs> I was really interested in making a comic about that moment because I feel like that moment was more significant to and, me. And just because your your comic is kind of text heavy, can you just real briefly describe what happened? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, I made it in this windy kind of way because when it happened, I was like not sober. So when I was retelling it, it was just this windy, winding, rambling thing. And I don't know if you've had the experience of like not being sober and finding something funny and then you can't remember why it was funny like when you're saying it <laughs> to people, but that's sort of what happened. Um, but basically uh, I was at a bar and it was right next to my house and then my friend and I went upstairs because she got pretty drunk and she was trying to like hook up with this guy and it didn't work out and it was like funny again. And so we went up to this, we went up to my apartment. I was on the second floor. We were right in front of the door and these guys that we had seen in the bar like came had come into the building and had come up the stairs with us and then they basically tried to force themselves on us and so we like went into the we managed to like get into the apartment and shut the door but immediately after that we looked at each other and started hysterically laughing and we were like wasn't that crazy like, let's just go to bed and then you know i'm retelling it and so um, um and here's the reaction here's the reaction shot <laughs> Yeah, so like life goes on for me the next day. And, and it wasn't until I saw people's reactions to my story that I realized like something was up. Um, so I don't know, I feel like that experience might be relatable to a lot of other women who are fortunate enough maybe to not have a ton of terrible experiences like that happen to them. And then when it first happens, you don't realize that it happened to you. Um, and so I thought that that might be really relatable. And at the time I was 20 years old and I think about how naive you are in college. And so, um, yeah, that's it. Um, all right, so I, and, and now I'd like to actually, Diane, I wanna start with you. And a little bit of the thinking um, was it specifically the Trump comment that inspired the, the whole book? Like, did this all come out of that? Like, what, what made you want to do this to begin with? Anger. <laughs> Very simple. Um, Trump thing certainly was part of it, and all the revelations that came out was part of it. And I started thinking, okay, I have a lot of friends, and no, people don't talk about this to each other. I mean, some people do. They find someone they can confide in or they get into a group that's helpful. But mostly, people blame themselves. And there are very common reactions. Um, people freeze and then they say, why didn't I say something? Like I have, in the introduction to the book, I have an example where I'm coming out of anesthesia after um, foot surgery and I see that the doctor's hand is on my breast. And I'm like, I freeze. I'm 25 years old. I think I'm a feminist. I'm in women's comics. And I, I'm embarrassed. And I don't say anything. And then I kind of, I forgot about it, but not completely. You know, it was still in my memory. I could still talk about it. But then as I was doing this book and I was getting all this work coming in, I started having more memories at least three more memories of like one time where I actually had 
If I hadn't fought really hard, I would have been raped. From a friend who was doing me a favor, carrying a box up five flights to my apartment. <laughs> anyway, so there's a lot of underlying feeling. I started worrying about, well, what about, okay, the hell with all these famous people. What about regular people? You know, is that guy a predator? Is that guy a predator? Is that woman been raped? You know, who are these people behind their facades? And I wanted to explore that. I want, it definitely came from Me Too. You know, it was definitely, that was a big part of it. But I didn't contribute to Me Too. I really didn't read a lot about it. I, I, um, I believed it completely. And I wasn't really ready to read those stories. So anyway, as a, as a cartoonist, as I said before, and an editor, I decided, let's explore that. I know a lot of women cartoonists, and I looked on the internet, and that's how I found a huge number of cartoonists that I didn't know, and it was really, really important to me because I wanted to have cast a really wide net, and I think that we did. So. Did you, so, oh, sorry, don't mind me. Did you invite people, or did you do an open call for submissions? No, I invited people. I looked at the work, and I saw things on Instagram, and I went to the websites, and I went to Wikipedia, and I found people that I thought, if they had a story and they wanted to tell it, would be good contributors for the book. So I did not put out a call. I, I didn't want to reject people. I wanted people who... I respected their work and I wanted them, if they had a story, to tell it. And I gave them permission to tell it any way they wanted. You know, I edited a little bit in terms of continuity or clarity. That was all. And so there's some black and white work, there's color work, there's really in your face horrible drawings of rape, or attempted rape, actually. And there's metaphor and poetry and Everybody had their own way of wanting to tell a story. And these are like, you know, completely different ways and they all contribute to it. And I do suggest that you take it in small doses or just flip through it and see what appeals to you and read it, you know, because the cumulative effect is just shocking, you know, that women have to I mean, you know this, you sort of know it from when you were a little girl. And some of the stories in this book are about little girls. And you put on your armor and you leave the house, you know. And I, I grew up in New York and I went to, I commuted to high school in the subway. So I was, you know, I knew how to be a person in New York. You don't make eye contact, you know, all that stuff. But as a kid, I didn't have anything horrible happen to me, but I know of people who did. And I just wanted like a, a place that people could put their feelings and their stories and share them. And these are cartoons, some, something about the visual quality of comics makes it go into your heart and your head easier than just reading it. So. I think that this was an important educational tool as well for men and women. And um, I guess that's it. I think one of the things, as women, we know, like, well, let me ask you this, Diane. Did you have anybody respond to you and say, no, I actually don't have a story? Yes, one. One. OK, <laughs> yeah. Because this is something that happens to all women, but most guys don't know about it. I had like I had three or four women who wanted to do it, but then one backed out and said she couldn't handle it. She wasn't ready to tell her story yet. And so I had that with a couple of people, cartoonists whose work I really liked. And then there were people who, you know, that just didn't answer because they were busy or they, who knows? You yeah. Know? But there, there were many, many more talented women cartoonists that could fill like 10 of these books. So. 
So, so now I want to put this out to the creators, and any of you can answer this. Why did you, what made you answer the call? Like, was this something that you were already thinking about, or did you go, oh my god, like, what, why did you say yes to this? I, I was like, oh my god, Danya Noon is in <laughs> Well, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you grabbed the obvious that's answer, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think everybody kind of had, I don't want to speak for it, but it was, it wasn't the most pleasant experience making a comic on this topic, but it's like, if Diane wants us to do it, you know, I, mean, I really like, that was it for me, you know. I, yeah, I agree with that. I think I actually emailed Diane specifically and said, I don't talk about stuff like this. I don't really make work like this. But then Diane was so supportive. I was like, I guess I can reach in and figure something out. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was really pulled in. And I'm so bad at deadlines, too. I think I emailed you a million times being like, I promise next week, next week, next week. <laughs> and there was definitely that moment where I was like, I guess I could just back out. But that was the point where I was like, no, the reason I really want to do this is to be with all these amazing creators and kind of have it be this like this object that we're all part of and making it like the powerful thing that it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was honestly really excited to work on an anthology as an artist because um, Kelly and I are, are editors of an anthology. So then to be invited to participate in an anthology from the artist perspective, I thought was really engaging and inspiring as well. And I had done comics about other instances that would have fit in this book. So it was like territory I had tread before. And it was like, oh, how do I do this again about a different story in a new way? And it was like, the more times I can regurgitate these things, it's going to be better. So it was just like, OK, you're going to do this. Like, I'm excited to do this, but also I'm going to do this no matter what. One and, thing, just, um, a lot of people, probably almost all of them, told me this was the hardest story they ever did. And even, I mean, if you've done it, stories about that topic before, like you have, then that's probably not true for you. I but mean, it's hard time, every time. Yeah. It, it was very interesting. And I had some cartoonists, um, some well-known cartoonists, like Mary Fleener, um, tell me that it changed their way. This is a woman who's been drawing you know, comics for 40 or 50 years. She changed the way she felt about drawing comics, and that she had all these ideas about other stories that were extremely personal that she wanted to do. So that, that was also a very interesting reaction. Did you, so did you, each of you feel that did making that comic change you in some way? Like, it, like, uh, like Diane is saying with Mary, like was there an emotional impact? Did it turn you in a different direction artistically or personally? I would say I also had done a comic that was starting to tread some of this territory. I mean, well, it was treading this territory, but I hadn't quite figured out how to process it yet because it was still really raw. Um, so that's in one of the Dirty Diamonds books that we put out. And I felt like this comic really let me revisit this from a years later perspective where I had gotten to unpack it a little bit and figure out like, where am I at now? Mm -hmm. um, so I remember putting that comic out when we published that issue and being really scared of people talking to me about it. And I did have lots of people talk to me about it. And every time I was like, my heart's pounding, I'm sweating. I was like, oh man, I don't know what they're gonna say, what I'm gonna say back to them. And it was just always a really good engagement when people would bring it up to me. And it was never kind of being like digging deeper or anything like that. They were, they were kind of just saying, like, I see this and I acknowledge it and thank you. And I think it was the thanks that was really hitting me. And I was like, I can do that. Like, I can, I can you know, have this evidence of like putting my story out into the world. Someone being like, yeah, you know, I kind of also hit that kind of experience and seeing it as very affirming that I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. So I think that this also helped me just kind of have that moment of exhaling and be like, oh, I'm really scared and I don't want people to talk to me about it, but I do want you to talk to me about it just a little bit. Um, so it's, it's like scary to put something that personal out there, but I think every time you do it, I come back like a little bit stronger and I'm more confident in the kind of messages that I want to share with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, I, I feel like it was a little 
it was freeing in the sense that, um, well, I had a conversation with Siobhan Gallagher, who's another contributor to the book, um, and she said something really great, which was that like it's not really up to you to decide how valuable your work is to other people. You know, like you can't just be like, oh, my story isn't good, and I don't think my story is good enough, so it's not worth being in the book, which I feel like was my initial reaction um, when being asked to do this project, and so I think that. I think that sentiment is really sticking with me as I move forward, is that like, yeah, it's not up to me to decide whether it's valuable or not. I think every time you write a comment about something you you struggled with, it's hard to do. Um, but I will say I had to talk about like the process of having to work on this comic uh, with my therapist like a number of times. Like I had to be like, I'm still doing this thing. I'm going to do this. It's kind of breaking me. But I'm going to do this. Um, but I think that's also an important part of it as well. Is like, okay, I'm having to manifest this thing. I have to look at this thing. I have to relive this experience. But I also want this to be visually beautiful. But I also need to deal with my feelings. But having a place where I could talk about it and be freaked out, but then walk away and be like, and now I'm going to hit my desk again, was I think really important and was a really good learning experience about the support that is around me and that you can seek out. Yeah, that's it. That's actually an interesting point because I had a therapist once tell me that that part of the healing process is going out and talking to others. Mm -hmm. You know? And and uh, it seems like that's that's what some of this is. Um, this is a very it's a very broad topic. You know, it's like saying I'm going to make an anthology about animals. Uh, how did you focus, like, and each of your comics is very specific. How did you focus in on the approach that you were going to take and the imagery that you were going to take? And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to uh, express visually, too. So I'm, I'm curious about, like, what your thought process was as you went into each of these, as each of you went into your comic. I can talk for myself. I had a really hard decision to make. I. I first intended to do the story that I told you about the doctor's office and just have it be one of the stories, but then I felt I really had to express the anger. And so my story is more about that. I have done really personal stories and that I think freed me or made me more interested in doing this. I did a story about miscarriages a long time ago and that was really hard to do. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that it was valuable. At the time, there was very little about miscarriages that people were talking about or writing books about. Now it's a lot better. But it's still something that women feel like a failure, or, and it's a death. And they feel that, I read some, very recently that the worst comment that can happen is, um, somebody congratulates you on being pregnant because you're overweight because you've had a miscarriage and you know and that's just devastating so anyway the, that led me to consider doing this as well as you know other experiences I've had and I was amazed at the wealth of really really good cartoonists out there that I saw on Instagram I, when I started doing comics and women's comics, uh, definitely women were a minority in, in the comics world. And um, then I did Twisted Sisters, and, and that was um, saying, we're not a minority and we're good. And fuck you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. So I did two of those. And then I just you know, did various things in my life and, and worked on things. But when this came, I just, I didn't feel, I just made the decision really fast. And it came together really fast, which is amazing. And um, here it is. So does anyone want to talk to you, talk about like your, how, you, how you came up with your specific imagery or your specific approach? I mean, we've dealt with this a little bit already, but... I could say that I normally do comics that are, like, really colorful and, like, kind of 
in your face with fluorescence and things like that. But for my comic for this book, I I couldn't do that. I didn't even want to use color at all. So that was kind of weird. Like, so I did this black and white comic, and I mean. Each, there's 12 instances in each of these. I did think of each of them could have been the whole story, but I thought, why not just group them together? And it's interesting you say the, the cumulative effect. I mean, the book itself, like when I got my copy, I was like, I, I can't believe there's all these amazing people in this book and this is what we have in common. It's, it's I mean, the fact that we're all here after having to deal with this shit is, is cool, but, um, yeah, it didn't seem appropriate to me to do my my happy color style. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know for mine, I because I rewrote this so many times, I kind of had to go down to like what was the rawest feeling I was trying to communicate, and I just started writing kind of free form the conversation that I'm ending up having with myself. So I just kind of like spat out every single thought that I had on the matter, and then edited down from there to kind of be like, okay, what am I actually trying to say and think here? So it was definitely a throw it at the wall, see what sticks, and then let it kind of create itself from there. I love the image yeah. of everybody inside your head, coming <laughs> into your head, and then all your different selves are sitting around and talking in your head. Yeah, really it's, it's beautiful imagery. How did you choose the color? I did decide that I wanted to do a color fill because I, I typically work in black and white and grayscale, but I wanted to have some kind of like mood set. I'm the opposite of you. <laughs> but I wanted to have something that kind of set the mood. So I was like, well, if I just kind of generally like like choose a color that's that I'm kind of feeling with this. Um, but because I was working in this very limited color palette, uh, that's kind of where the fire imagery came from. Um, it just kind of like naturally evolved from there. And then I was like, oh, this is kind of the thing that makes you like differentiate these different people. It labels them. It kind of shows like a little bit of extra emotion in various moments. Um, so it kind of just created itself through its own process. And I think it was because I was so lost in trying to identify exactly where I was going when I agreed to be part of the project. So this, this comic very much more so than a lot of my other work that I do tend to put together like really frenetically, really quickly of like first instinct, go. Um, this one I really let itself kind of evolve and, and become the final object. Um, I really like slice of life mundane comics and um, it was really important to me with this experience to kind of show it in a way that to really emphasize that it was not a big event. It was like just this thing in this train, you know, um, of your life, I guess. Um, and so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to boil it down to this one kind of almost insignificant moment where I'm telling this story um, and what the reaction was. And so that kind of guided it instead of that kind of veered me away from making the actual incident into a comic and just making the comic of me telling people about what happened. Uh, for me, I wanted to avoid having a narrator. I very often in my work will have uh, like my narratorial voice over the imagery. And I wanted to avoid doing that because I didn't want to give the reader uh, I didn't want them to have my opinion. I didn't want to just like tell them how they should feel about this. I wanted them to experience this as I experienced it and to have to kind of like come to their own conclusions on it. And also at the time I was like getting a bunch of work together. So I had like sort of dabbled in a bunch of different um, tonal styles at the time and had kind of come to this point where I was like, oh, I sort of like the way this looks in this piece, so I'm just going to run at it again here, um, which I think worked really well. I like it. The background almost looks like an aqua tint. Yeah. It's, you know? um, so it's a, it's a, I did a, a very, very, very light ink wash on a very, very toothed paper and then mm -hmm. scanned that in and then used um, like a darkening feature to do the darker washes because I wanted the like variation in the gray tone to come through. Um, but it was sort of one of those like manic genius moments where you're just like, oh, I did this, I did this, I did this. Oh, damn. <laughs> Isn't that what every artist lives for? Yeah, exactly. Pretty much. Yeah. 
So moving out of the of of the of the realm of creativity to to more the subject matter again, um, what is and, and maybe Diane, you can start about talking about this, and then the others can chime in. What is your purpose in doing this book? Is it to start a conversation? Is it to make things better in the future? Or is it just to vent? Probably all three. OK. You know, the, it's, it's not a solution to a problem. It's an examination of the problem and um, sort of spreading out news that probably every woman knows about the problem. And it's about expectations of under patriarchy and um, women having to protect themselves all the time, even though, and men very often don't even have those thoughts. I mean, sure, a guy might not want to get into an elevator if it looks like there's a tough guy in there, and maybe he'll beat him up. But most women find getting into an elevator a very fraught experience and waiting for the doors to close and who's going to come in at the last minute. And that's just a normal part of life. You know, that's not anything unusual. So Diane, as, as you and I are, let's just say, the senior members of this panel, one of the things that I find frustrating, and, and my daughters are 24 and 25, is that you would think the kids would do better. You know, like I went through this in the 80s, and my daughters went through it again. And I kept saying to them, well, you don't have to, like I thought I raised you, you don't have to put up with this. But it's, it's so hard and it's so personal. So I wonder if seeing these stories on the page will maybe be helpful in a way that my motherly lectures don't appear to have been. Mm -hmm. well, People will find their own ways of relating to the various stories. And it may be more helpful seeing someone has gone through it in some similar way to you, um, as opposed to your mother warning you. It doesn't really help to be warned, because it's like learned behavior. And it's survival. I mean, this, this book talks about survival. And that means in a very specific way. But in general, Women have had to adapt to survive in a world that's basically run by men. And, you know, they've made enormous strides. And the Me Too movement has made really amazing effect, I think. It's still very hard for a woman to report a rape. And depending on the situation and geographically and just a million other things, um, it's humiliating and um, just you don't want to deal with it. I mean, a lot of the stories talk about that. But since Me Too, at least the, the value of he said, she said, and she said, he said has been reversed mm -hmm. a lot so that it's the men who have to defend themselves and not the woman. The woman is being believed. And usually that's because there's like one woman comes out and then six more come out and eight, you know, so there's like a, a wave of, because these people don't just hurt one person, you know. There's actually been some fascinating research done on this with DNA recently, where they ran DNA from rapists, from rape kits, and what they discovered, there's been a few places where they've, they've pledged to do, uh, run all their rape kits, that it's the same person. And not only that, if the person is in their system, they're often committing other crimes as well. Yeah. So it turns out that, yeah, people do tend to repeat this behavior, the people who do it. Um, so younger ladies, I mean, again, I was, I was like, this was happening to me in 1985, and I thought it was a problem that was going to be solved by now, and it's not. Um, so how do you approach it, and how has Me Too changed your life? Uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, my husband saw me getting catcalled outside a bar in like our neighborhood. And um, I, my, my response to catcalling is you're not behaving in a way that denotes that I need to give you my attention. So I just completely don't, I don't own acknowledge it's happening. Um, but he came like rushing up to me and he was like, oh my God, are you okay? Did that really happen? <laughs> like, did this happen to you? And I was like, 
all the time. Like, are you new to this? Is this a fun fact for you? Um, so I then, from that moment forward, I will text him or tell him every time it happens. <laughs> oh like, my God. immediately after somebody says something dumb to me on the street, I like text him and I'm like, and this is the circumstances and this is what happened. Just to make him aware of how prevalent it is and how like being a woman, just walking around the city, you're just like berated for taking up space on a sidewalk. Um, and I felt like this book is a very similar kind of like, oh no, here's the receipts. Like, and again, and again, and again, and again. And I told him he had to read the book and he got about uh, like three comics in and was like, I gotta, I gotta take a step back. I gotta take a break. And I was like, I'm gonna make you read this whole thing. Like you have to, it's the rules. And it's like, <laughs> I kind of wish that was like it was required reading. It it should be a movement because a lot of guys. I mean, like my husband, who's a really good guy, like he just had no clue. You no, know, he's he like, no clue. who would do that? Why would they do that? Can I just say that's really unacceptable, and I've I've had it, and I just want to say like I I'm not gonna get all like a tacky about it, but you know, like we've done our work. Like I need some of these male presenting people to step up. Like I think when we were at the Strand, I said, <laughs> I, said I said, you know, like maybe we should have an anthology called Sucking at It, where <laughs> male creators can talk about how they abuse their power, you know, because there are so many things you can do. You can stop the elevator door if you think something weird is going on in there. You can tell somebody to leave if you know they did something. You can talk among yourselves with your dude friends at your dude parties and try to discourage each other from having these kinds of conversations that you know you wouldn't be having if one of us walked in. So, you know, this was difficult because over and over again, people who have experienced like certain um, gender-based violence, like violence against like racist shit, like, you know, you then have to walk people through like, Here's what it's like to be queer and to go to a wedding. You know, it's like, would you just like look around? You know, like, yes. so thank you. <laughs> yeah, we were kind of talking about um, like this question and those kinds of ideas, yeah. and it's like, oh, now that this book exists, like, what do you want it to do? And it's kind of like, that's it. Like, we did the thing. Like, we told you the story. Believe us. Like yeah. everything that happens from here is now somebody else has to react. Yeah. There shouldn't have to be forty women coming forward to accuse somebody, accuse someone of rape for someone to be, you know, brought to justice. Like it really takes one person and this trend that we're basically crowdsourcing like victim stories in order to bring people down and I find that endlessly annoying. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I also find with like social media, it's like really easy to like know all the right things to say. You know, I find that with a lot of men who like to think of themselves as like feminist or whatever, like they'll, they know all the things, but then when you think about how they're actually applying it in their real life, most likely like their coworker doesn't feel safe for like maybe their wife or their kid, like, you know? Um, and so I just think that like, if you're not applying these things in real life, you're not actually like helping anybody, you know, um, and to maybe be more conscious of that. We had a, a signing in, in um, LA and it was very odd because the, it was a small, small amount of people that showed up and they were all men. And it was like, okay, why is, <laughs> I don't get this. and. It was fine because they were interested and they asked questions and um, I don't think it was, there was nothing that was attacked or, you know, confrontational, but there was one guy at the end, a cartoonist who's sort of well-known, I'm not going to say his name, <laughs> told me about a, a group of men, dudes, <laughs> cartoonists <laughs> in L.A., who had, had a little secret society where they just so supported each other and talked to each other. But he said the thing that was weird about it was they talked about things the way you'd expect Trump to. They talked about pussy. They talked about, you know, just, just in the most, 
And these are people that you would not think, would, I don't know who they were, you know, he didn't tell me their names, but I just felt like it was so discouraging to hear this, like, okay, it's reacting, fine, you can react, but this is what it's like, you know, it's the locker room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Trump's never been in the locker room. <laughs> That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. You might have gotten a massage. Maybe, oh, all right, all right. <laughs> I, and I just, and this is a little bit off topic, but I, I want to make this analogy because I think it's a very telling one. In the same way that basically all women have been through this, all people of color have experienced, or at least everyone that I've known, have experienced micro and macro aggressions. And yet, when you say this to 90% of white people, they're like, what? No, nobody does that. And I'm like, no, you don't do that. But does that mean that it doesn't happen? Because that, to me, the situations are exactly analogous. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, one of the artists in the book, Awan Mance, is um, a black woman teaches women's studies in, I think, Mills in Oakland a very liberal art, very liberal college, and she felt torn, you know. Am I more comfortable in a room, mixed gender, all one race, or in a room with all women of different races, and how, you know, it was just like examining it for herself and feeling that Me Too wasn't really part of what she went through until she finally realized that she had friends who had written in and that it was part, but she's still in this kind of dichotomy and torn. Um, I, I wanted to have, we're all, our time is almost up, but I wanted to have a little bit of time for people to ask questions. So does anybody have a question? Yes, front and center. Um, I do want to say, and I don't know if this came up in the book, I definitely want to find the book for you now. Um, the thing that you're talking about, like you did the book, you did the thing, you, you did what you had to do, and the, the idea that I've heard that called is don't teach women not to get raped, teach men to not rape, mm -hmm. um, is really the thing that we need to carry on with that. Um, but I also do want to say that there is another dimension to it because fat women don't really get catcalled because people see fat women as not even people. But at the same time, when you're a plus size person, and I've had that like, oh, how far along are you? And I, I was like, not. <laughs> um, but there's a whole other like level of degradation because of the things that people assume about overweight women and what they think can have done to them. Somebody took a picture of me in a Wonder Woman outfit and put it on its, uh, not encyclopedia, it was something called, but it has it sounds like encyclopedia online, and wrote all this degrading stuff about me. Oh my God. About what comic book girls like to do. I'm sorry. And a friend of mine got it removed, but like there's like a whole other level of like, like just, just that. And, and I think that's part of what saves me from being catcalled, but also if I'm dressed like this, it's also a little less likely to happen as well. But, but you know, just, you know, there's like, when you are a plus size person, there's there's like a whole other level of film, and it's, it's not fun. Yeah, yeah, thank you for saying that. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for all the Like, I had a situation at work uh, happen, like, not to me, but something's going on at work. Um, and this, like, staff wide message went out just to say that, you know, like, the leaders really support. Anyone who wants to come forward to report harassment or any weird comments, blah, blah, blah. and I read this email and I was like, "Dude, you did this! <laughs> like my oh, friend man. said that you told her hit, told her about like sex dreams and stuff. Oh. So it's like the first thing to do is to just fucking stop. <laughs> like you just need to for one second. The way that we are constantly thinking about like what could go wrong in any situation or what someone's saying behind our backs, like mm -hmm. stop for one fucking second and maybe change your course of action." Encyclopedia Dramatica. Um, oh, yeah. Well, but this is happening a lot. Like, the people are getting, like, savvier with defend, like, attackers with defending themselves. They're like, I keep hearing people, like, using the language that you would use if you were oppressed, like, without themselves having ever been oppressed. You know, it's like all of a sudden, like, this, what is this, pre presidential harassment? Like, that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, the man has literally like roofied the nation. He's getting away with it, and and yet he's the oppressed one. And I, I see that a lot. So this person sent out that email 
to protect themselves. Yeah, it's to be yeah. like, well, look, I, I did the thing. It's like, yeah, but you also did the other thing. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. We don't get to win. The, the witch hunt, what he doesn't know is a bunch of witches are hunting. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, he's Let's, not a witch. Excuse me, we have someone else who wants to make a comment. Yes, question. I need to tell all of you that my book came in the mail this week, so I read it straight through, and I commented. Mm -hmm. I need you to know that it's comfortable. Actually, I totally second that. I know everyone's saying like absorb it in spurts, but I just face fed it, and it was I was really prepared to be like I'm gonna go hide under my bed and never come back out, and I didn't feel like that when I got to the end. Like I got to the end, and I was like, we're doing this, we're in this together, we're here to support each other, and that there is movement. Like things, things are progressing. It's a snail space but forward momentum is inevitable. Yeah, and I think of, and if anything has been accomplished by Me Too, I think the solidarity element of it cannot be understated. Absolutely. Jen, sorry. I just, I'm gonna just say, you know, I'm, I'm uh, a mom, and I grew up in New York City with just a pervert on every block. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I a lot of New York love today. I have yeah. experiences. <laughs> Um, you know, not, not, not as bad as, as many, but um, I have now have a daughter. Um, I mean, I, I've raised her up and she's 23, and, um, and she has had worse experiences, experiences than I have getting grabbed and catcalled. And, but I, as I've looked at social media, as I've watched her grow up, I admire this generation of women tremendously. She has she has a scorched earth cause <laughs> and I don't. And I'm not kidding you, but I and I'll really try to make this fast because nobody wants to listen to a good story, but I was on a bus from New York to New Jersey. I, I ride it a lot. There was a perv on the bus. This was the first bus perv I'd seen on this route in three years of riding it. He sat down next to a young woman on the bus, you know, unbeknownst to, to we're all just reading our books. Um, and he must, and he put his hand under the thigh. He then moved, and it was a little odd that somebody was moving right after the first stop, you know, after leaving the station, Port Authority. He sits down next to me, and he puts his, his hands like this, and then one hand is creeping toward my thigh, and my only really great was just like, not another curve, it's been a lot of years. You know, and I just gave him the hairy eyeball, and he went through, <laughs> as they do, you know, they're horrible cowards. Okay, the young woman comes past me uh, as, as we got uh, off the turnpike, and she said, did the man sitting next to you do something to you? And she said it in a loud voice, and I said, oh, it's fine, whatever, I grew up in New York. And she said, um, no, he did this to me too. Did he put his, what did he do? What did he do? And she made me say it. And I'm like, this is really getting out of hand. And I said, he, he, he put his hand on me. And, and, uh, and then, and I wasn't even bothered. I was almost like, uh, you know, I'm an antique. You know, amazing. <laughs> um, but she went to the bus driver, who was a lady. <laughs> and the bus driver said, I'm calling the police now. And the police came. Now, here's to the funny part of the story. The young woman wandered off because it was her stop. We'd stopped in, you know, uh, uh, we got not to the first stop. She wanders off. And the cops, we all have to wait till they arrive. They come on the bus, and the lady driver walks them down to me and asks and says, now, will you please tell them what happened? And all these commuters around me are like, oh my God, get our asses home, please. <laughs> and, I, and I just, and by then I told the man to, you know, to go sit somewhere else. And so then I just said, you know, I've seen a ton of perverts in a very loud voice. This guy is a run of the mill, cheap pervert. <laughs> Don't, uh, and, and I really don't care what happens to them. Do what you must. And he, but he did this to two of us, and, the, and I don't know where the other chick is. She wandered off. And sure enough, they, the guy, he broke his bus ticket. They marched him off the bus. And, uh, you know, they probably took him off somewhere and gave him talking to. 
But you know, at least he was out fifteen dollars for his ticket. And but I sat there going, first of all, how could this chick be so spacey that she couldn't follow through on this with me? Or was she scared? But also look at the difference in one generation. Look at that difference. So the kids are doing better, is what you're saying. I think they're doing a great job. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said that if you do know that someone's doing something, be as loud as humanly possible about it. Um, to tell a really quick story, there was a guy at one of our local comic meetups who was like getting up to leave with his wife and just pulled my shirt open while he was leaving to look down my chest. And everyone saw it and I was kind of just like, what the fuck just happened? And he came back to the next month's meeting and everyone was like, we know what you did last time, but he's like having a great time, puts his whiskey down in front of my friend and was like, watch this while I go have a cigarette. And we all collectively spat in his drink. <laughs> <laughs> Made sure to toast him when he came back in. <laughs> so just make people aware of who the chief perverts are in your circles. Very good. Very quickly. Um, at, when Me Too started and Kavanaugh and cases coming out, I went back to Night in the Mosses, almost handled the Pittsburgh Terrace, which uh, was very cathartic. And um, I get a lot of comparisons from reading her stuff, but I also feel a lot of loneliness in how she writes. And I've only read a few stories since I bought this this morning, and I already feel like the power in this is because it is collectivist, whether it's collectively kicking someone off the bus or collectively sitting at someone's <laughs> drink or collectively writing. This is very powerful, and thank you, because as much as we're holding space for you when you're writing this, you're holding space for me, and I really appreciate that. It's so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our time is up. I'm sorry. Uh, this is a great note to end this on, though. I will say there is going to be a signing immediately after this at table A25. 2.30 to 3.30, says. Yeah, it's just, it's just down that way in the big row. So thank you all for coming, and thank you to our awesome panel.